Okay, well, I guess we'll get underway with the uh, the second presentation today, which is dealing with the topic of nutrients in the Great Barrier Reef marine environment. So where are the nutrient loads delivered to the Great Barrier Reef uh, generated, uh, some of the dynamics of their transport, and what are their ultimate environmental uh, impacts? Now, nutrients tends to be a fairly complex issue to deal with in, uh, for a number of different reasons. There's a whole range of different nutrients. We just tend to concentrate uh, in the Great Barrier Reef on nitrogen and phosphorus, but there's also a number of different forms uh, of nitrogen and phosphorus in the environment. So we have particulate nitrogen and phosphorus, and that's just the, the N and P that's absorbed or adsorbed onto sediment particles. We've got dissolved or soluble inorganic nitrogen, and that includes some of the things like ammonium, nitrate, and nitrite, and also dissolved phosphorus. They tend to be much more readily bioavailable for uptake by primary producers like uh, plants and, and phytoplankton. So they tend to attract much more attention because of a well-demonstrated role in uh, ecological impacts, particularly in the, the coastal zone and marine environment. And then we finally got some of the more dissolved, you know, get, uh, dissolved organic nitrogen forms, um, but that can get a little bit of tricky terminology there because some of it includes uh, artificial man-made forms of dissolved organic nitrogen like urea. So it's a bit of a messy space. There's also a bit of debate around through time about what's worse for the environment, uh, nitrogen, uh, you know, a ton of nitrogen discharge to the marine environment versus a ton of phosphorus. Uh, but the general consensus uh, at, among most scientists is that nitrogen tends to be the biggest player in, uh, in environmental impacts out in the, at least in the aquatic environment when it comes to marine ecosystems, because nitrogen is more of a limiting uh, nutrient in marine environments. But it's important to remember that these different nitrogen forms, particularly whether they're particulate or dissolved, it can have really big ramifications on exactly where they have their impacts, uh, their time lags to environmental effects, and, uh, in, and ultimately what their environmental impact actually is. So where are the nutrients coming from that we tend to find um, out in the Great Barrier Reef marine environment, particularly from flood plumes? Um, dissolved inorganic nitrogen forms, uh, we tend to think it's really dominated by catchments with a large proportion of uh, intensive agriculture. So commodities, particularly like sugarcane and bananas uh, from some of the areas like uh, wet tropics catchments and, and maybe the lower Burdigan and Mackay. When it comes to the particulate nitrogen loads, they tend to be highest coming from uh, catchments that are dominated by rangeland cattle grazing. So catchment uh, basins like the Fitzroy, Mary and Burdigan River. And uh, the general estimates that we have for dissolved inorganic nitrogen, particulate nitrogen and phosphorus forms is that their, their loading has probably increased anywhere from sort of three to six fold uh, since uh, human settlement and land use changed throughout these catchments. But this probably does lead into an important point I wanna make that um, better management of diffuse uh, nutrient and fertilizer losses from agricultural crops it's certainly not a problem that's unique to the Great Barrier Reef catchment. And I think that's nicely illustrated by a couple of the graphs here up on the slide. And these were taken from a review study conducted on the topic by Peter Thorburn a few years ago. And what these two graphs are illustrating is the relationship between total nitrogen or dissolved inorganic nitrogen export or loss from a catchment versus the amount of fertilizer applied to the, the cropping system. And what they're saying basically is that there's a strong and consistent relationship between fertilizer application rates and how much fertilizer is lost to the environment. But if we look specifically at the Great Barrier Reef cropping commodities, which are depicted by those triangles in red, um, what we can see there is that there is nothing particularly atypical or unusual about the loss rates that we see from Great Barrier Reef crops. And they tend to sit quite nicely along that line of average loss that we see for the relationship at a broader global level. So to extend on from that, it's, it's not at all surprising to find that if you're a farmer or an extension officer or a scientist working in the United States, in Europe, in Asia, you're very likely to be working on exactly the same uh, diffuse water quality management challenges that we face in the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, and in some cases, you're actually grappling with water quality issues that are even more severe and pronounced in the Great Barrier Reef. So it's certainly not a, uh, a challenge where, where uh, it's special or unique to the Great Barrier Reef catchment area and its industries. So what I'm gonna talk about now quite quickly is um, how far uh, these catchment derived particulate and dissolved nutrients uh, are transported and travel into the Great Barrier Reef marine environment and what's their ultimate, uh, what we think is their ultimate fate and ecological impact. 
So what's the fate of particulate uh, nutrients in the marine environment and flood plumes? There's still a little bit of debate around this, but uh, most people, most scientists now think most of that fraction is initially deposited quite close to the river mouth, where it could be subject to a range of different scenarios, uh, such as burial in sediments, where it might become inert through time. Uh, it could slowly be released um, from sediments after a certain period of time and then become available for, for biological uptake. Or it could even be, uh, in the case of nitrogen at least, become denitrified as inert uh, nitrogenous gas. But uh, very recently, scientists also think that the, a small fraction of that particulate nutrient remains entrained in flood plumes, where, they, where it does become uh, processed and biologically active in a fairly short period of time. So if we go back to this slide here, looking at the, uh, the Burdekin River sediment flood plume, and, and uh, discuss it in, in, in the context of nutrients. We think a lot of the particulate nutrients probably behave a lot like the course of sediment and probably fall out here, uh, fairly close within 10 to 20 kilometers of, of the river mouth. Very different story for the dissolved uh, nutrient forms. Like that fine sediment, uh, we think they, they've got the potential to travel, travel uh, many hundreds of kilometers. And you can actually see that green tinge in the water, which is a phytoplankton bloom. Uh, demonstrating that sort of effect there, which is heading well up the coast. Uh, and we also, we're not entirely sure yet, but the role of dissolved nutrients in these um, sediment flocks and how they're generated and creating that sort of marine snowy uh, effect, still a bit of an unknown. But as well as that, uh, that little bit of uncertainty about the role of uh, dissolved and particulate nutri nutrients in the development of those sediment flocks, we do know that um, increased nutrients can have a really big effect on those phytoplankton blooms that you can see on the, on the previous slide. And it's also nicely illustrated in this picture of a reef um, taken off a, uh, one of the, the wet tropics river basins with a lot of intensive agriculture and, and uh, increased nutrient inputs. You can see that green tinge in the water. And those phy phytoplankton blooms they can really produce significant reductions in water clarity and light penetration, um, which can really affect some of those benthic plant communities like seagrasses uh, and corals, particularly if they're around that um, sort of zone of, of maximum um, natural light penetration. But that increased uh, phytoplankton can in also increase populations of filter feeding organisms on the reef. So things like bivalves and clams and polychaetes that sort of mine and burrow into the coral and uh, that, there's potential for that to increase sort of the long-term erosion um, of the coral uh, skeletons themselves. But that increased set of, uh, nutrient uh, input, it can also increase uh, fleshy macroalgae or seaweed, if you like. And you can see a lot of that growing on, that, uh, on this particular slide as well. And that can have a range of uh, ecological impacts. It can crowd out the corals. Uh, it can really affect the capacity of settling coral to find a place to, to live and grow on the reef. And there's also uh, a line of thought that it's increasing the susceptibility of, of corals that are already there to, to disease uh, and really affecting the long-term health and resilience of the ecosystem. Another important point to make about uh, increased dissolved inorganic con nitrogen concentrations is that it's not directly toxic or doesn't directly uh, impact uh, the coral organism. But there's a lot of uh, fairly solid emerging scientific research that uh, highlights that elevated DIN concentrations can actually negatively affect the ability of the, the coral organism itself to host the populations of the, the blue-green algal symbionts that are a really important part of their, their physiology. And they make them much more uh, prone to sort of discharging or ejecting these um, microorganisms that live in the coral skeleton. But that affects really uh, increased in many ways with increases in temperature. And that's a real concern with some of the, uh, the forecasts for increased uh, water temperatures in line with global warming predictions. So there's a real concern that um, elevated nitrogen concentrations can also have a, a big role in sort of increasing, if you like, the impacts of, of global warming on the severity and extent of, of bleaching events. Okay, and the final topic I'll be talking about now is the potential role of uh, nutrient uh, enrichment nutrification in fueling crown of thorn starfish outbreaks. So there's uh, a general scientific consensus that the frequency and severity of crown of thorns uh, outbreaks has increased uh, in, in recent decades. 
the exact mechanisms that, that, that's causing it is still a matter of some uh, debate. There's one school of thought that uh, removal of the adult predators of crown of thorns starfish from the environment is perhaps a bigger contributor than we, we previously thought in fueling the severity of these outbreaks. And the other school of thought is that uh, coastal eutrophication and nutrient inputs fueling phytoplankton blooms, which are a really important food source, source for developing crown of thorns starfish larvae, uh, is what's really driving a lot of these uh, increased outbreaks. And there's quite a bit of uh, laboratory evidence to support the, the role of nutrient enrichment in increasing survivorship of uh, COTS outbreaks, uh, but actually conclusively de demonstrating this out in the uh, a complex environment like the Great Barrier Reef um, still hasn't been uh, completely uh, resolved just yet. So just in terms of a couple of key take home uh, points about uh, nutrients in the Great Barrier Reef marine environment, it's really important to recognise that nutrient enrichment um, of coastal ecosystems is not something that's just a problem or unique to the, to the Great Barrier Reef catchment and the industries in it. It really is a global challenge that we're struggling with virtually all around the world with intensive agriculture. In terms of some of the more specific points, um, particulate nutrients we think at this point tend to fall out fairly close to river mouths. Um, their spatial extent, at least initially, is quite limited. Dissolved nutrients, uh, they're a bigger problem, we think, and they tend to travel much further out into the Great, uh, Great Barrier Reef environment. And they have the potential to inf influence particularly the inshore Great Barrier Reef and, and perhaps to some extent the mid-shelf. They have a really important uh, role in fueling algal blooms, uh, outbreaks of phytoplankton and also macroalgae. And they could have a potential role in uh, increasing the survivorship of uh, cots larvae and subsequent crown of thorn starfish outbreaks, in which case they can have a much water, uh, broader impact across uh, most reef ecosystems in the Great Barrier Reef.